Hello! So let's start out talking about the arcs that I read in June, no, May. There were two. One is coming out pretty shortly. I will put it on the screen, but I think it's like the 20th of June. Um, but this is the short story collection, 19 Claws and a Black Bird by Agustina Bastrica. This is the author of Tender is the Flesh, which is one of my favorite uh, completely unhinged books. And so I was very, very excited to receive this arc. Uh, my cat is getting involved in the filming setup, sorry. Very excited to receive this, very excited to read it. Unfortunately, it was not a hit for me. I didn't hate it. Short stories are, I think, for most people, quite hit or miss. I love short story collections. I think that's, like, relatively unpopular on Booktube, but there are definitely short story collections that I just absolutely adore. There are some where basically not a single story worked for me and then most of them are kind of somewhere in the middle. And this one was in the middle towards the side where really most of these stories did not work for me. And I think weird short stories are particularly prone to this kind of uh, not working. <laughs> like I love weird short stories but I haven't posted my review for this yet on Instagram because they wanted it posted within two weeks of the release date, but I basically said like, I need it to do something for me, whether it's elicit a really strong emotional response, have a really strong point about some kind of theme or topic, even just be really, really, really atmospheric, you know, like, really take me into some kind of experience. Like, I don't need necessarily to have a really strong point, although I do prefer that. I really like short stories that really hit, uh, like, societal issues really strongly, um, but they don't have to. But this one, most of these stories to me felt very pointless. The writing was really skilled, but ultimately, I don't know. There were probably three stories, I think, that I can even remember and that I did really like. The last two stories were, I think, my favorites. Yeah, there were just very few of these stories that really paid off for me. And it wasn't that it was a bad reading experience, but it just was disappointing based on how much I love the author's previous, you know, novel and how much I wanted to adore this. But, you know, it's okay. Uh, it wasn't bad, and I do think that it's worth a try if you like weird stories, because I just think that it's so individual on what works for people and what doesn't. Um, the other arc that I read was called Yours for the Taking, and this does not come out until December, I think. Again, I'll have it on the screen, but really, really, really liked this book. At first, I was a little bit worried. So it starts out very hackneyed or something. I don't know how to explain it. There's a lot of like lingo. So we start out in 2050. Climate change has accelerated beyond the point I think of what's realistic. Like, not that I want to be like downplaying the importance of climate change, but it, you know, it's only been like 25, 30 years from now, and they have changes already that are prompting them to like leave the Earth's surface, which I don't think is realistic. But anyway, but they're also talking about, you know, terminology from now, like white feminism is, or girl bossing, you know, that sort of thing, that they're talking about it as if it's like ancient history. And I'm like, that was one generation ago in this book. Like, we don't talk about feminist terms from the 90s as if they were ancient history. You know, it was just a strange disconnect to me where I was like, you should have just made this like 2200 or whatever. Like, I don't know. But anyway, so I was a little bit concerned at first, but I actually ended up really, really liking this book. So the premise is that, so there's basically uh, one specific colony of people who are going to be like preserved, saved from climate change who, that is being run by a very, very famous like white woman billionaire. And so she is recruiting some people to help with the project who we follow as characters. Uh, there is a black woman who is um, kind of a 
a masculine lesbian who is a doctor. There's a trans woman who is kind of her administrative assistant. And then there's some other characters who are going to be residents of this colony. So you're seeing this kind of from multiple different perspectives and I thought it was so interesting. I did think that the storytelling is not not perfect. Like I think this is this woman's first novel. She has a memoir I, if I'm correct and she is a white woman, the author. There were just some kind of glitches I think but overall again did not expect this book to have the emotional impact that it had on me, and I think that it's talking about very interesting things and obviously very timely things. There's like three books in this wrap-up about white feminists. So yeah, I definitely recommend checking it out when it does come out because I really thought it was worth the read. Okay, moving on with uh, literary fiction. I read Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. I can't believe that I have taken this long to continue reading her work. I read The Convenience Store Woman several years ago now and really, really enjoyed it. I didn't think it went quite far enough for me. Um, and Earthlings really uh, took care of that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did really enjoy it and have always intended to keep reading her work. I just hadn't gotten around to it. And so I did finally read Earthlings and I really, really liked this one as well. Um, so in this story, we are following a young woman. Well, in the beginning, we're following her as a child. And this was uh, really surprising to me because I had heard a lot about kind of the taboo aspects of this book, that it talks about a lot of taboos like incest and cannibalism and that sort of thing. But I was unprepared for the fact that there are also a lot of content warnings that are a little bit more like common, I guess, like uh, content warnings to have like child abuse, very severe child abuse, child sexual abuse. And those are like, you know, things that people just kind of gloss over in favor of the incest and cannibalism, but they're definitely there. So be aware of that. But so yeah, we are following this girl, Natsuki, and she has a cousin who uh, she is kind of in love with and they are both a little bit outcast by society, especially Natsuki. And so she grows up and ends up in kind of a marriage of convenience, I guess you could say, like a, an arrangement with a man who also doesn't fit in with society. And so eventually she and her husband and her cousin kind of meet up and uh, start building their own society in a way. And so, yeah, I thought that this book was really, really interesting. It did focus more on the taboo stuff than I really cared about, but I think it had a really, really interesting discussion of, you know, kind of just being an automaton, thinking that you want what society wants you to want because you've just been raised to think that way. Um, it has a lot to say about compulsive, about compulsive, compulsory has a lot to say about compulsory heter heterosexuality or just sexuality in general. And that is where I do have to say here, um, this is commonly said to be about um, that her husband is asexual or even that maybe that she is asexual, blah, blah, blah. Um, that was just a marketing mistake, I think. Um, it says very, very explicitly in the book that her husband is heterosexual. Like it literally says those words and says that he, it's not that he's not attracted to women, it's that he is basically sex repulsed. And she comes across a little bit more asexual than he does, but still it's never stated like this is not asexual rep and honestly, if it was, it would be a little bit concerning that it is because there are some really problematic <laughs> stereotypes about asexuals that are turn out to be true about this man who, again, Sayaka Murata was very careful to explicitly tell us that he is heterosexual. And then the marketing people were like, sexless marriage, I got it, he's asexual. And it's, that's not, that's not true. So in case anyone needs a little bit of a primer <laughs> on this topic, asexuality is an orientation in the same way that heterosexuality or homosexuality or pansexuality or whatever else is an orientation. So it is not a sexual activity status. It is not a libido level. It is an orientation. Asexual people do not 
experience sexual attraction. And obviously, like all sexuality, it is a spectrum, so you could be somewhere on the spectrum, and I did actually get like a little bit of pushback on this on Instagram. I don't want to say pushback, but I got conversations in my DMs about this when I said it on Instagram. And yes, it is a spectrum. Um, and I would encourage anyone who feels that they fall between heterosexuality and asexuality to use the appropriate labels, which would be gray sexuality or a spectrum. Uh, you know, obviously I'm not here to police anybody's label usage. You can use whatever labels you want, but this was not that instance at all. This was not an instance of someone feeling like they were between labels or that both labels applied. This was truly just marketing making an error because it says in the summary of this book on all platforms, on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, everywhere, it says her asexual husband. So I don't fault people at all for continuing to say that about the book but it is that is wrong like and i wonder whether sayaka murata knows that it's being marketed that way and consented to that or not because again she was very explicit in the book that 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 was not the case so i don't normally talk about this online but i am asexual and aromantic so uh i feel quite confident in this assessment. I generally regret talking about this online when I do because it never really goes well for me, so <laughs> please be nice. <laughs> but anyway, after that long digression, um, our next literary, I guess, would be Perfume by Patrick Suskind. So if you have seen my Seven Books in Seven Days vlog, <laughs> you already know how this is going to turn out, but I was listening to the audiobook of Perfume in Spanish, and this is originally a German book. It's kind of a German, you know, modern classic, a very, very popular book. And it is set in the 1700s, maybe creeping into the 1800s, I'm not sure. We are following a young boy and then man who has, like, a superhuman sense of smell, and he is uh, becomes obsessed with creating the perfect human scent after uh, becoming a perfumer. And so he ends up becoming a serial killer, you know, <laughs> as one does. And uh, yeah, I think I need to give this book another try at some point, but it probably will not be anytime soon. I just found the story incredibly slow at first, and that is not something that I am great at in Spanish yet. Um, I tend to uh, get the brain wandering and then at the end everything's happening like all at once and I still didn't care and yeah we got to some incest stuff that I just was like I just checked out mentally so it was an interesting premise and I think it's possible that if I read this in the right mood and in the right context that I would have really enjoyed it but this was not the mood or the context, so I did not. <laughs> if you have read it, I would love to know whether you think it's worth it to revisit. Uh, next up, I guess, we will talk about Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. I tried to do a reading vlog of this, and after finishing it for several days, I kept trying to record my thoughts on it, and I kept just <laughs> wandering in circles verbally and finally I was like forget it I'm just gonna wait until I do my wrap-up and hopefully I will have more more coherent thoughts by then it's a very straightforward book in some ways but it's very complex in others and I am seeing quite mixed reviews of this mostly positive but I am seeing definitely mixed reviews and um, some of them I totally see what they're saying, and some of them I do not. <laughs> this is a, like, satire, kind of a, I would call it, like, a satirical literary thriller, if I was gonna have to, like, label this. We are following Juniper Hayward, who is a white aspiring author. She's had one publication, and her friend, Athena, who is a Chinese-American author who is wildly successful. And when Athena dies, June has the opportunity to take one of her manuscripts that no one knows about yet and pass it off as her own, and she decides to do this. Lots of other things unfold, and it talks about the publishing industry at length and how they 
you know, facilitate things like this and the incredibly hypocritical ways in which they will tokenize certain authors of color, but uh, generally still prioritize the works of white authors and help white authors take on identities that are not their own and such. So really, really thought-provoking, really great book in my opinion. I really liked this. Uh, this is probably my least favorite R.F. Kwong book, but that's not really saying anything because I love R.F. Kwong. Like, she's maybe my favorite current author. So on to some of kind of the criticisms that I have seen. I have seen a lot of people say that this is kind of topics that have already been in conversation for, you know, a decade, blah, blah, blah. She's not adding anything new to the discourse, and I can totally see that for people who are in the community, in publishing, in the book community, in that sort of thing, or even people like really attuned to, uh, you know, issues of race and uh, racism in the United States because it's really all it boils down to. Like, obviously there are differences, nuances between industries in the exact way in which that shows itself, um, but it's ultimately all the same thing. But to me, like, you know, this is going in Barnes & Noble, there's a whole table of them at the front of Barnes & Noble right now, it's in Target, it'll probably be in like Walmart, I don't know, you know, like this is going out to mass audiences. Obviously, you know, she's not like Stephen King or anything yet, but like this is going out to mainstream readers. She has reached the mainstream, I would say. So I think that this will be shocking to people. And even if it's not shocking, again, I talk about this all the time, but I have such a hard time saying that anything is like passe or like rehashing the same issues has nothing new to say when those issues are still present, you know? Like if this is so something that's already been around and been talked about, why is it still happening? You know, I don't know. The other thing that I see a lot is people kind of feeling really, really confident in a way that I find problematic <laughs> in assuming that Athena is an author insert character for R.F. Huang. She has said in um, talks about this, like in events, that explicitly she is not an author insert and that she is like the worst, that she sucks, you know, because it is complex in that like she's talking about more than just plagiarism, more than just, you know, racial shenanigans on the part of white people. She's also talking about the nature of writing, the uh, kind of parasitic nature of taking someone's story and profiting off of it, particularly if it is something that you have not experienced yourself. Like, she talks a lot about the fact that Athena is a privileged member of the diaspora, writing about really, really visceral, physical, emotional struggles that, you know, despite it being part of her ancestry, she has never experienced. And, you know, she talks about Athena being guilty, potentially, of people taking, of taking people's words, taking people's experiences and profiting off of them without any credit or compensation. And so, you know, I think it is a really complicated book in that it talks about a lot of different things. And there are people who critique Athena in the book for things that R.F. Kuang has been critiqued for. And so people felt really, really comfortable <laughs> in immediately saying, oh, Athena is like the author insert character. And I think that that is questionable. I mean, obviously, specifically since she has said that she's absolutely not the author <laughs> insert character. But I think that Kuang is giving those criticisms a a platform, you know, saying like, yes, I am a member of the diaspora who has never experienced a lot of the stuff that I write about, and that is inherently problematic. Does that mean I shouldn't write it? You know, like, I think that she is in entertaining those questions and not writing them off uh, the way that some people are accusing her of doing. Yeah, so I don't know. I feel like no matter what R.F. Kuang does, people read her books with the least generous view, you know, like people assume the worst about her intentions, kind of no matter what, and it honestly makes me feel like this book, you know, like the topic of this book of like, why do white writers get away with absolutely everything and authors of color or, you know, non-white writers 
can't get away with anything but anyway obviously a lot of assumptions have to be made anytime you read a book but it just seems like people are taking assumptions the worst direction every time they have the opportunity in this book and I just it doesn't make sense to me but again I do think that it's well worth the read to figure out yourself it is not a very long read it takes very little time to get through this uh, very different writing style than all of her other works. I absolutely recommend it. I did re-listen to Things We Lost in the Fire. Um, I've been trying to reread some books in Spanish, so you will probably see more of those coming up, but I just re-listened to this collection of short stories and I did like it just as much re-listening to it as I did the first time. Uh, not perfect stories to me, but really, really good. I think that they are well worth the read. Definitely horror stories, so bear that in mind. And I read Hija de la Fortuna by Isabel Allende. This is the first book in the trilogy that La Casa de los Espíritus is a part of, but this is like very loosely a trilogy. It's basically just following the same family line. It's not really a direct like series. So anyway, we are following a girl named Eliza. She is of at least partially like indigenous descent, but she is being raised by white British people in Valparaiso in the 1800s. And so there is a lot of uh, classism and racism and everything in the first part of the book where she is with them. That part was kind of boring, not gonna lie. You're following several different European characters in Chile who all are kind of very unlikable for very good reasons. <laughs> but I did really enjoy the Eliza character. And then you end up with her going to California for the gold rush. And that was actually very interesting. Um, so she and a uh, kind of a family acquaintance, I guess you could say, uh, named Tao Qin, who was essentially kidnapped from um, Canton in China in order to be a laborer on ships, which was a very common thing. Both of them end up going to California and living there for a while and traveling around and kind of seeking what they desire. So there was a lot of conversation about the uh, kind of race dynamics, the class dynamics of California during that time, the way that land was completely destroyed, stolen, ransacked, uh, how towns came to be and go away, and just all kinds of interesting stuff about that. So I really enjoyed this book. Uh, it was not anything like House of the Spirits for me, you know, absolutely was not like gripped in the same way. It didn't feel like a really, really important book to me, but nonetheless, I did really enjoy it and it didn't like deter me from my quest to read all of Isabel Allende's books. <laughs> Some genre fiction. I read two Nnedi Okorafor books and I do have a reading blog dedicated to these. Um, this is a middle grade book focused on the story of a young boy whose father is murdered and he has some powers that allow him to try to figure out what happened to his father to kind of get justice potentially to try to take care of the city that his father was the sheriff of. And I really, really enjoyed this. It was a super quick, super entertaining read. It does get quite sad and dark for a, a middle grade book, obviously, but it was very, very good. Highly recommend. Who Fears Death? And this is the first of, I believe, two books in this series following a woman named Anya. Well, we start out following her as a child, and she is the product of a kind of never-ending war between a light-skinned race and a dark-skinned race in what we find out to be Sudan, I believe. So she is viewed as basically cursed because she is the product of this, you know, violent encounter. She ends up discovering that she has powers and starts training as a sorcerer, basically, um, in order to use those powers and try to bring about you know, justice or peace or whatever you want to call it. 
and I really really loved the premise of this and the structure is a very typical like uh, hero's journey. If you could have taken out this whole part of the book, I would have absolutely loved this and basically recommended it without any reserve. But I found the way that she talked about sexuality very annoying. Um, I think that there were aspects of it that were really, really great, and I do talk about this a lot more in the vlog, but uh, female genital mutilation is a major topic of this book, and I think the way that she handled that was extremely nuanced, extremely um, empathetic, understanding. That was not my issue at all. My issue was very aggressive heteronormativity of this book. They spent like a hundred pages fighting and bickering over who was sleeping with who, you know, stuff like that. And it just, I didn't want to read it. You know, I don't care. It was very boring and frustrating. Uh, not discouraged at all, again, from reading Nanny Okora 4. I absolutely still want to read the rest of her works. This one just did have that, like, very disappointing aspect to me. A contemporary, I read Carrie Soto is Back, and I loved this book. Um, so this is by Taylor Jenkins Reid, who is the author of uh, Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. And there are issues with Taylor Jenkins Reid's works, and I do highly recommend the video by Jessie on YouTube about The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. She's not, you know, an author that I stand by, but I did get this book for Christmas and I really, really enjoyed it. So we are following Carrie Soto, who is half Argentinian tennis player in the United States. And she is retired at the beginning of this book. She's kind of the greatest of all time in this universe. Um, and someone equals her record for the number of Grand Slams won. And so she comes out of retirement to try to take back her record. And so we're just following her through that season as she and her father, who is her coach um, try or trainer, try to succeed in getting this record back and so that doesn't sound very interesting unless you love tennis <laughs> i do like tennis i don't really follow it but i was obsessed with venus and serena when i was a kid and i do enjoy you know playing some some very bad tennis but i don't really follow tennis but this is just so good like taylor jenkins reed is a very very talented author in making you care about these characters and making you follow these events that you would think that you had no interest in. A major theme in this was the sexism of the um, sports sports reporting sector kind of and so interspersed in here there are where it is like showing you uh, reporters conversations or news articles and that sort of thing and just the casual way in which they will talk about female athletes um, and the things that they will accuse them of like Carrie Soto is very very kind of cold as a person like she will say exactly what she thinks about something regardless of other people's feelings whether or not you think that that's right or not <laughs> you know the fact of the matter remains that the male athletes are out there, you know, breaking their rackets and tr threatening to assault judges and all this stuff, and yet no one bats an eye, but then she says something like that, and everybody's like, the bitch, <laughs> and like, you know, they call her the battle axe, and like, all these things, and obviously, like, they couldn't do this on the English title, but on the Spanish one, clearly it's supposed to be like, the bitch is back, but for, with Carrie Soto instead, so... Anyway, really, really enjoyed this one. I do think that it was well worth the read. A uh, thriller that I read this month was Not So Perfect Strangers by L.S. Stratton, and I really, really loved this book. I listened to the audiobook, and so this is another one of our white women <laughs> um, books for the month, but this is um, telling the story of a two women, primarily our main character is Tasha, and she is in an abusive relationship, and she is not really able to leave because her son does not want to leave. Then she comes into contact with Madison, who is a woman in just kind of an unhappy relationship, and Madison has the idea to, that they should 
off each other's husbands and Tasha wants nothing to do with this, but ultimately she doesn't really have a choice <laughs> if someone forces her hand. So this was so, so interesting, so good. I really, really liked it. I think if you like thrillers, uh, definitely check this one out. It was very, very good. The only nonfiction that I read this month was The Pinochet File by Peter Kornblue. This is, again, a nonfiction book that is written based on all of the declassified documents about the handling by the U.S. of the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile. If you are not familiar, this was Chile elected its first, like, socialist president basically in the 70s I think or the very late 60s and the U.S. was like oh no 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 we cannot have this and uh, helped basically create an environment in which a coup was destined to happen and then supported that dictatorship regardless of what they did in order to um, create or protect this uh, dictatorship, the U.S. was just like, meh, whatever, it's fine. So this book goes through all of the documents and proof that exists about, that is declassified anyway, about how the U.S. did this, and um, yeah, it's appalling. It is absolutely terrible and a very important read, so I do recommend it. On a much lighter note, I read the a sequel to the book Witchlings, um, The Golden Frog Game. And this was really, really cute. Uh, Witchlings was one of my favorite um, books of last year or the year before, whenever I read it. And just because it was so cute, so heartwarming, just absolutely adorable. And this one was also cute, adorable, heartwarming, but it had a little bit less impact for me. But I still absolutely recommend it if you read the first book and enjoyed it. I think that this is just such an adorable series. So we're following a few young witches, witchlings, who are basically not picked for a coven as part of their society. So the society only allows a certain amount of wishes in each coven and then the rest are spares and they kind of have less magic and they are treated really, really poorly in society. And so our main character it ends up being a spare in the first book and so she has to kind of fight to try to keep her magic and have a place in society and then in this book you know things have gotten a little bit better but she has different skills and different talents that their society doesn't necessarily appreciate also it's very cute all of the magic is spanish like all of the spells are in spanish clarabelle ortega is a uh, Dominican author, you know, Dominican American. So really such a cute series, such positive messages. Other children's-y things, I re-read uh, this graphic novel in Spanish called Magalina. I believe it, it wasn't initially translated into uh, English because it is originally in French, but I think it has been translated now and I believe that they are called Sorceline in both English and French if I'm not wrong. But this is a young girl who goes to this school for magical, for learning about magical creatures, not at school, for magical creatures. Oh yeah, cryptozo cryptozoology. Uh, yeah, she's trying to solve a mystery of what's happening at this school. This is a series but I've only read this one and it is very beautiful. The artwork is lovely. The story is kind of meh, but very, very beautiful. Then I did listen to the book uh, La Puerta de los Tres Cerrojos. This is a series of middle grade books written by a Spanish author, and it is essentially trying to tell kids scientific principles through storytelling. And so this one at least specifically is about quantum physics. I'm not sure if the whole series is about that or not, but really loved the premise, uh, really hated the book. <laughs> you know, it was all well and good for a while. So our main character is a boy who's kind of, I think, um, maybe like middle school aged. I'm not sure, who um, kind of skipped school one day to try to figure out uh, this clue that was left for him and he ends up 
going into this other world, this other dimension where he's learning all of these scientific things like matter and antimatter and stuff. And um, he meets this fairy who is a doctoral candidate in quantum physics and she tries to teach him some stuff and they go on an adventure, whatever. Um, there's all this weird flirtation between them, which is really gross and weird since she's supposed to be in like <laughs> her mid-twenties and he's a child. But then also the narrative itself was quite sexist at many points, which again is really disappointing because... Uh, the author is a scientist who is a woman, so, you know, I was mad. And lastly, I believe the last book that I read was Rojo by Carlos Sisi. This is a vampire story. I do not think this has been translated into English. This is like an apocalyptic kind of, you know, end of the world story about vampires, and I have very mixed feelings about this. It is a trilogy and I might continue. I can't decide. We'll see how I feel about it long term, but it was overly long. It was like a 23 hour audiobook and really all it was doing was setting up the world, you know. I found the good parts of this were that I found the way that he developed the vampires very, very interesting. So he also apparently has written a zombie series and I feel like you can tell because he managed to get kind of the apocalyptic walking dead type vibes in with also kind of the intelligence, the charisma, the hypnotism, all of that stuff of like vampires as well. So the way that he managed to do that was really interesting and not something that I've seen before, but I haven't read a ton of vampire stuff, so it might not be unusual, but for me it was it was good. I liked that aspect of it. The bad was that I felt like his character work was really, really shoddy. We have kind of three main characters. There are more later in the story, but you have a military guy who is just a total jackass, very stereotypical American military person. Uh, you have a, a woman who is a police officer and a young boy who is like 12 maybe and no 13 I think and they are traveling together and <laughs> so the 13 year old is brilliant has read a lot of stuff about zombies and stuff and so he figures almost everything out like he's the one who gives them all their good ideas and stuff which whatever I'm okay with like brilliant kids in stories you know it doesn't really bother me except that our woman was a complete idiot like she was worthless hopeless completely inept at absolutely anything so you have the guy who's like you know the the muscle and a lot of the brains you have the kid who's most of the brains and then you have the woman who literally her only role was like caring or usually what it usually ended up being was just her being like Oh, Dios mio! All the time. And this was also narrated by a man, so it was even more insulting to just hear his voice doing her wimpy little shrill thing. And like, obviously, you should be afraid in that scenario. Like, there's no judgment from me about being afraid at like the end of the world. But the fact that she was just completely useless and like, she was supposed to be a police officer. No love from me for the police, but like there's no way she would have made it being a police officer in the United States with that kind of attitude. Like they would have laughed her off the force. Absolutely. Like toxic masculinity is not going to tolerate that. <laughs> so I don't know. It was just, it was so annoying and just, oh man. And like once more characters got introduced, everyone just kind of felt largely the same and so I just felt like his characterization was really really poor and when he tried to spend too much time on characterization it was really bad so I was like you needed to focus more on plot and less on characters but he didn't really have enough plot to focus on other than finding out more about the you know vampires so I don't know it was very strange and there were also just things that felt really weird to me like the vampires can't go out in the sun, and so they have pretty much all day, every single day, to do things, but they never, like, you never see them really gathering any supplies, like, 
prepping in any way, which feels to me like the first thing that I would do. I don't know. It just, there were aspects of it that he would spend so much time developing certain things and then other things that I was like, are they doing this off page? And if so, why? You know, it was just a very strange, unfocused narrative. But again, I didn't hate it. I, I'm considering continuing the series at some point, but I'm not sold either. So, you know, whatever. So I think that was everything. I have completely lost my voice now, I think. So uh, yeah, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next.